It's Kilale. Kilale, okay. Rather than Kilalea. Hawaiians yeah. look at it and say, oh, that's a Hawaiian name. Yeah, yeah. It does kind of. Hawaiian, but it's actually a, the Gaelic, a Gaelic um, well, an anglicized form of a Gaelic mean, the, the uh, son of the gray servant or son of gray's servant. <laughs> Welcome to the Hawaii Catholic Herald Highlights Podcast. I'm Anna Weaver, the Associate Editor of the Herald. And today I am talking with Father Pat Killale. If I said that correctly, like you just mentioned, um, Father Pat is a Sacred Hearts priest uh, assigned to Kalapapa on Molokai, which is a very unique assignment. Um, he's also a jubilarian this year, celebrating 60 years of profession in the Sacred Hearts Order. Um, so thank you for letting me talk with you, Father Pat. You're welcome. Yeah. Um, can we talk, start a little bit with, um, where you're from, because you're not from Hawaii originally. And then, um, yeah, why you decided to enter religious life. Well, I was, uh, I tell people I was found at the end of a rainbow, but I was actually born in, <laughs> in the West of Ireland, uh, and grew up in a small farm. So like Damien, I like to say that I'm a son of a farmer, but I've been called a lot of, of other things, okay? Uh, in, um, in my, uh, I guess it was Easter time of my uh, senior year uh, in Ireland in high school or secondary school, uh, one of the um, priests of the Congregation of the Sacred Hearts, who happened to be from my own parish originally, uh, came by and uh, started conversation with me. And later on in the summer, uh, the vocation director came, came by, and uh, that's how I got recruited. Okay. So in the uh, August of uh, that year of 1962, I began uh, my time as a Sacred Hearts, uh, entering the novitiate in Ireland, that's like, I guess you can call that uh, boot camp, uh, religious boot camp. And uh, after a year there uh, with my classmates, I flew to, uh, to Boston and then on to New Hampshire, where I studied for six years. Okay. Yeah, and you, you had mentioned you couldn't even really um, talk to your family because they didn't have a telephone, I think, in your bio, your Jubilee bio. Um, is that true? Like you, there was a long time you weren't able to see your family or talk to them? That's true. I'm not sure whether they were happy or not, but anyway, uh, I was not in because of most, I, I come from the countryside and I think phones were very limited in those days, uh, in the sixties, uh, not just for my home, but the, the whole neighborhood. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was only later, actually, after my ordination sometime that the family got a telephone and then it began to become popular in, in the whole area. Okay. And um, what brought you to Hawaii after you had joined the Sacred Hearts Order? Well, um, it was part of, well, it was its own separate province, we call. I belonged to the East Coast province and ministered there for most of my uh, my uh, my life since ordination. But in uh, 2004, I came to uh, Oahu uh, for a workshop uh, on what we call a secular branch. Actually, it's, it's like a third order. You are familiar with the third order of St. Francis, I'm sure. The, we have a third order we call the secular, secular branch. So I came to that workshop. At the end of the workshop, a group of us uh, flew out here to Kalapapa uh, to visit uh, for a day. Uh, and then um, I went home shortly afterwards. I figured this was the last time I'd see Hawaii. Mm -hmm. But two years later, my provincial superior, now in the heavenly realm, actually, um, asked me if I would cover uh, Kolopapa for the summer of 06. So I said, sure. 
And uh, then the, uh, I, I did that uh, term here and enjoyed it. So my provincial superior, as well as my classmate who would become his successor, uh, felt it was, uh, you know, I, sh I should be open to coming here. So in 2011, um, the East Coast joined with Hawaii, making one province. And the new provincial, who was Jonathan Harrell from Hawaii, came to the East Coast and asked if I would be willing or happy to come as the chaplain uh, pastor of Kolopapa. So I said, sure. And so I arrived here on June 29th of 2012. Okay. And you've been here ever since? Been here ever since, okay. yes. <laughs> I'm kind of curious how much you learned about St. Damien, then Father Damien, throughout your formation and as a Sacred Hearts father. Is he often talked about? Are there you know, other prominent Sacred Hearts legacies like Damien that you learn about? Well, I, I, I read about him. I don't recall the name of the book, but I did a lot of reading in those days. Um, and all kinds of books. Well, good books. <laughs> yeah, and uh, so I learned something about him. And of course, when the I was recruited, I was given materials, uh, which included uh, included Damien. Uh, reflecting back on, on my seminary days, which were in at the base of Mount Monadnock in New Hampshire, uh, I don't uh, recall having too many um, certainly discussions on Damien. It was basically a time for philosophy and theology. Uh, so uh, probably, uh, it was probably after ordination that I learned more about uh, Damien. Uh, his uh, work, his ministry. Okay. And um, obviously, what that first summer you were here, you were kind of immersed in Kalapapa. Um, can you compare what you thought it would be like on the peninsula, uh, you know, before and then now that you've been here for uh, more than a decade, right? Two decades now? Is that? Uh, I, I've been here. Uh... Uh, 10 years, 11 months, and about uh, no, 11, yeah. <laughs> 11 months, no, 10 months, I think, so, okay. um, and uh, less a few days, okay. Uh, I, I No, I don't find it much different. I think the fact that I was here for that summer of 06, I, uh, for three months, I, I experienced it uh, pretty much as I do now. Uh, one thing I didn't get ex to experience at that time was in being involved with uh, tours and uh, and my own personal uh, times of hosting with couples or so on. That uh, uh, that would have been uh, different. I did have concerns on coming here that being a small area and being confined, I might have felt uh, not isolated, but too confined, but mm -hmm. uh, that never became a real factor. Uh, and uh, though my schedule is, is certainly light, uh, I did enjoy over the years uh, until the COVID hit, um, hosting uh, uh, people who called and asked if they could uh, have me sponsor them rather than the tour itself. Okay. I guess they felt it was might be more religious. Now I don't know whether it is or not, <laughs> but uh, that's the, that's the way it worked out, and I was quite busy. Now it, it's starting to build up again lately, though the tours do not come in. Uh, as a matter of fact, I I did actually conduct a number of tours. Uh, we had tour groups, but um, once in a while the uh, the driver or the host for the tour didn't make it. So I was kind of the emergency person. Okay. <laughs> and uh, that was, that was enjoyable. Enjoyable. Yeah. Yeah. I, I was on a tour pre COVID where the very fancy tour van broke down and we had to like go to a couple of vehicles, I think, including yours and a pickup truck. And I don't, I don't know, we, we, we went to different cars to get around after that. So 
you were I remember just, that day yeah. it broke yeah. down out of the cemetery yes yeah yeah so you you came to the rescue there with helping us figure out all those logistics so yeah yeah right um but call papa was shut down during the pandemic um still is pretty much you said starting to open up a little more but i would assume that's more like guests of residents versus tours uh yes it, it opened up really for the possibility for family and friends of the patients and then eventually the workers they could come uh and at that stage we could each of us as a resident could sponsor three people okay since that time it has increased to to six, which was the original, which was the original understanding. Okay. Uh, now um, we can really sponsor, uh, keeping it to six, uh, people who do, who want to visit or be on pilgrimage. So that's opened up a little more. Uh, I didn't notice this morning. I got a an email uh, with regard to the you know the uh, laws or guidelines which have gotten a little more strict again oh okay so anyway that that's do you that's have to show a vaccination right to to come or vaccination card and that's that that's correct yeah okay. they, they have to be uh have vaccinations the full vaccination be it that could be could be two or could be two plus okay um and that has to be put through the board of health and then they give clearance to the uh, to the uh, Mokalali airline uh, to make to make a, a confirmation of, of flights. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I don't know if, if people who haven't been to Kalapapa before fully realize it still is very isolated. Um, I remember you shared a column with us um, about you were flying to another island and the pilot took you to topside instead of down to call papa so you were you're stuck you're on the island but you can't get down to call papa unless you're going to hike or you know you have to wait until the next day right to get a flight down yeah that that is correct and that was only a couple of months ago i think that was in in, yeah. in, in february and uh, the mm -hmm. flight itself had been delayed and delayed and delayed mm -hmm. uh until uh finally at about 5 30 to 6 o'clock we were given the clearance to Fly to Kolo Papa, mm -hmm. but as we approached the Kolo, uh, Molokai, the plane went to the south side, almost in the direction of Maui, uh -huh. and then circled back across the island and then touched down at, okay. at uh, its um, Ho'ola Hui uh, okay. airport uh, in Topside, and the we were told just... then that that was it. Yeah. Did the pilot just decide, oh, I'm I'm I don't feel like going down there or something? I don't know. I don't know how that works yeah, the, in a small town, right? So uh. Yeah, the pilots were both young, young pilots, and the flight itself had been bumpy. Oh, okay. Had we flew flew through clouds all the way, I think. So mm. they may have been directed not to go down to Kalopapa. So Okay. But anyway. And and how many people scrambled. live in Call a Papa right now. Um, that's a very good question. Uh, I'm just guessing maybe sixty to seventy, okay. which is down from the between ninety and hundred when I first came here. Okay. Uh, some at the time of the COVID, some people began to work at, from home, be it on topside or I don't know if some people went back to the mainland. Is there park uh, service so, people or? I just probably more the park service people. Yes. Okay. Yes. And, and uh, that's still that continues, you know, at, the, at this time. Okay. Uh, some people don't know that call Papa is officially a national park and operated by the National Park Service. So um, and they kind of control the the regulations, right? As far as when COVID was happening and everything is, is it that? Well, I, no, that would be controlled by the Board of Health. Oh, okay. But, but the National Park have some say in that. Okay. You know. Um, and you want to be extra cautious because there are still um, patients living on the peninsula that are, would have more health issues. Yes, our restrictions are because of the patients. The, mm -hmm. 
uh, we are kind of like the second line of protection. The nurses, of course, are the first. And then we are supposed to be careful so to protect the nurses who protect the patients. Mm -hmm. Although it's interesting to see that very often at the monthly meeting that we have, the patients probably will show up without their masks okay. while the rest of us are all masked. Okay. <laughs> well, you're helping them out, right? I guess so. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And I, I, from that latest um, email that I got this morning, I think one of the things now that the visitors coming in um, should, wear, I don't think it's mandated, but should wear a mask if they're in close contact, not only with the patients, but with us. Okay. The sponsors. And so the only time we're really that close is when I'm driving them over to the other side okay. and driving them crazy at the same time. Yeah, <laughs> I doubt that. Yeah. <laughs> um, I don't know if you can give anybody um, just a better sense of what the peninsula is like, you know, for somebody that might not ever get there, but um, how would you describe it to somebody who hasn't been there? Well, the color papa means the flat leaf. So I guess it, it, it is pretty flat, although it's uh, in the middle or not so much in the middle. We have the the crater, the dormant crater, mm -hmm. and it's I, I, it's mound. If that's the best word I can think of at this time, uh, in the middle where sometimes we take people to visit. Um, except is this where the cross is. Age, There's a cross up there. Where the cross is, yes, yeah. mm -hmm. yes. The cross is just a few yards from the edge of the. Uh, of, the, of the crater. You would not have gotten up there because the tours were are not brought up there. This would have been uh, when I was working at the Herald uh, like a decade ago. I was here 2006 to 2010. One of those visits, I think, at some point we went. So <laughs> Is that right? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, I have taken many people up there. Mm -hmm. Although, to be truthful, at my age of 79 and a little slower, sometimes I'll, I'll ask the people as we go by coming back, I'll uh, uh, you want to go to the crater, and uh, and they say, "Oh no, 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 we don't." And I say, "Thanks be to God." <laughs> you have to go up there this time, yeah. Um, yeah, because if if they go, if the the visitors go up, the the sponsor must accompany them. Okay. And um, I've always been struck by the quiet. I think I've been there five or six times. Um, it's it's very peaceful. Do people say that a lot to you? That they find it? Peaceful? Oh yes. Yeah, mm -hmm. the visitors will say that. Mm -hmm. I guess the only time, the only noise we make is the noise of the lawnmowers and at certain times when they, uh, they they rattle around, which is necessary. And same time, they 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 uh, scare my cats. Uh, oh yeah. I'm actually a lot of the number of people, especially the parents, take care of the wild cats. I have seven that uh, in my family right now. So. Oh, okay. But they the lawnmowers will scare the cat. They're used to a more uh, peaceful existence. Yes, for the most part, it's, you know, it's peaceful. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, and I mean, do you expect to just be here through retirement or do you know your, your future plans? Well, of course, when uh, I first came here 10 years and 11 or 10 months ago, uh, some of my brothers of the Sacred Hearts uh, felt that I was retiring anyway. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, I expect as long as my <coughs> as long as my health holds out and it's fine right now, mm -hmm. uh, one needs to be healthy, really, pretty healthy, uh, to come here to live here and and old enough to be able to uh, you know the word wouldn't be endure it, but to accept the slower pace. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I I I went to the Bahamas twenty years ago and. I had a slower pace there going from a very uh, uh, big parish in uh, Massachusetts. Uh, that's a difficult, uh, would be, could be a difficult uh, time for young priests okay. who would prefer to be in, in Oahu or Maui or wherever, where our priests are all in, in Maui, and in uh, Oahu anyway, except for, uh, except for uh, Molokai. Okay. So it would be a difficult adjustment for our young priests who would like to be involved in so many other things, involved with the with the youth, uh, indeed with people of all ages, and they would have an assortment of ministry uh, mm -hmm. to participate in. Okay. Uh, mine is obviously uh, lim limited. 
And you do have um, your own parish and daily mass? You, you do yeah, we have daily mass at six o'clock in the morning. Okay. We have uh, the two sisters, the retired Franciscan sisters who are retired, but not really retired. They're very active in their volunteer roles. Uh, one is helps, I guess, in the in the office, Sister Alicia, in the main office, and uh, Sister Barbara Jean uh, works in the grocery store. And then we have Meli Watanuki, who is, um, he's fa famous, actually, uh, some of us call our Bishop Meli. <laughs> um, so, I met her, uh, yes. Yeah. Yes. So those yes. are some of your regular parishioners then? You know. Yes, yes. And, and that's six o'clock every morning, Monday through Friday. On okay. Saturday, we get an extra hour. We have Mass at seven. And on Sunday, we have Mass at nine. Okay. And on the first Sunday of each month, weather permitting, which it is most of the year, we have Mass at St. Philomena. That's the church, Damien's church in Kalawao. Okay. Uh, so that's as far as uh, church. Um, and that's a, a little bit of a drive from where you are. Is it about 20 minutes or so? It depends on how bumpy would, the road is. <laughs> yes, the road is better right now since the COVID hit because that cut off the traffic. Okay. Uh, it's it's from church to church is 2.6 two, is, uh, 2. miles, but it takes, uh, you have to go slow. Even now you still have to go slow. Okay. Mm -hmm. You don't really have a lot of uh, road crews down there in uh, Kawapapa to, to repair things. Well, periodically, I guess in the springtime, the, the National Park, they have some gravel that came in, they brought in on the um, on the barge in July. Mm -hmm. they, uh, uh, they fill the potholes or the, the lanes or the, the drip, <laughs> I'm not sure, the little little uh, um, you know ruts in the road that were created by the winter rains mm -hmm. so it's 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 better now than when you experienced it okay yeah that uh, barge that you mentioned is um that's always fascinating to me once a year you get large items brought in on a barge like cars or appliances or other things like that that can't come in on small aircraft right so Right, they can bring in uh, household appliances. I, I got something by way of uh, of the uh, cargo plane. Okay. The cargo plane that brings the food and the mail. Okay. Uh, six days a week, Kamaka Air. Okay. Do you get to go back to Ireland much? Uh, well, I was back in September of last year to uh, for a vacation. I hadn't been once the COVID hit. Okay. Uh, and uh, I got to baptize uh, the second child of my nephew, uh, whom I'd married three years before that. So, okay, it nice. uh, was a little easier from uh, to fly from Boston to uh, from Massachusetts to uh, Shannon Airport. Mm -hmm. This involves uh, three legs altogether. Yeah. Yeah, I bet. Do you think there's been more interest since Brother Dutton's uh, canonization cause has been started? Uh, this being Joseph Dutton, who worked with Damien and Marianne um, in Call Papa. I would imagine that uh, eventually there will be. Um, certainly this month we are having, there are others that the sisters have uh, this month. As a matter of fact, next week they have a couple coming in. Um, I, I would expect that the, there will be uh, as the word gets around. Okay. Uh, so. Great. Well, and the last thing I wanted to talk to you about was if you had any highlights from your 60 years of being, um, you know, in religious life, if you had to say, you know, any of the, the true peaks or encourage those that are considering a vocation, you know, these are things to look forward to. Yeah. Well, certainly this is, as I reflect on my years, uh, this certainly is might be the biggest highlight <laughs> in my twilight years. Uh, of, I never dreamed that I would even be visiting uh, Hawaii. Uh, not to not to mention uh, being the um, the chaplain here in in Kolo Papa. 
Uh, obviously, uh, the day of ordination is important. Uh, and it was important for my family. It was May 25, uh, 1969. Uh, and uh, so basically, those would be uh, two, uh, two highlights. My lowlights was uh, uh, losing uh, my two parents and, uh, mm -hmm. and my sister and brother, unexpectedly. Oh, really? Two. Hmm. Yeah, especially being far from home, I can imagine that's that's difficult. Yeah, uh, well, for my the last one was my brother, and I was here at the time. Okay. So by the time I got home, he had already passed away, so, oh. which was uh, totally unexpected. Uh, 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 you know, so in in his case and in my sister, and both uh, had cancer. Oh gosh, yeah. Well, I'm just trying to think if there's anything else you'd like to mention or, you know, tell people about what it's like living in Kalapapa or being a Sacred Hearts priest. Oh, it's a wonderful time. It's great to be here in, in Kalapapa. First of all, to inhale the fresh air, uh, the quiet rather than a lot of busyness, uh, which I experienced uh, for most of my life. And it was my early years, of course, I enjoy that. If I was still young, the question would be, would I uh, feel comfortable, you know, here? So, um, yeah. and it's uh, wonderful being a brother, a priest of the Sacred Hearts. Um, and uh, I'm, uh, I'm happy that I chose this life and the, or the Lord chose me for this life, you know. Well, thank you for for sharing with us about a little bit about your your life in Kalapapa, and um, we appreciate you doing the podcast too. So yes, everybody will be able to see your lovely face as well on YouTube besides listening. So yes, <laughs> um, thank you, thank you. Yeah, and I'll just wrap up saying here that um, this has been another episode of the Hawaii Catholic Herald Highlights Podcast, and we will be back again soon. Thanks. Thank you.